current rivalry between Cody Garbrandt and Dominic Cruz had its beginnings long before Cody was even born. Way back in WEC 26, a seemingly unstoppable 27-year-old star defended his featherweight strap against a young, green, undefeated 22-year-old who was trying to make a name for himself, and thus began one of the most enduring rivalries in the sport's history. Considering the intelligence the two men would later reveal, the beef had a decidedly childish origin. It all began right here. With three titles on the line, WEC 26 was so stacked that there was just no room on the poster for Dominic Cruz. Now, whether Cruz was truly unhappy with his omission from the poster, or if he was simply jealous of the WEC's biggest star, remains unclear. It was most likely a combination of both. It pissed me off. I'm good enough to fight him, but I'm not good enough to be on this poster. I'm gonna be on this poster. And he expressed his contempt while signing the posters by defacing Faber's image, scrawling his signature right across Uriah's face. Faber interpreted this as the ultimate disrespect. This guy chose me as an enemy, and I gladly accept. That signature kicked off one of the most compelling feuds in the sport's history. A feud which has had numerous manifestations and encompasses almost all of the great highs and lows of Bantamweight history. The first chapter of the story ended quickly, with Uriah choking the fuck out of Cruz, squashing his perfect record in a matter of seconds. By Dominic's own admission, the early finish was due to an error on his behalf. He was fully aware that Faber had the grappling advantage, his game plan was to keep the fight standing. But in the heat of battle, he initiated an early takedown, which led to a quick submission. I can't find any interviews or quotes from the time, but considering the childish pre-fight hostilities, the frustratingly brief fight, and what we now know about Cruz's fiercely competitive nature, that submission must have been a tough pill for Dominic to swallow. In retrospect, though, Cruz appeared to be philosophical about the loss. I didn't stick to the game plan, and ever since that fight, it molded me to stick to the game plan. When you consider that many of Dominic's greatest wins were contested over five full rounds, that early lesson in temperament and discipline was likely a crucial one, and his style evolved to pretty much epitomize those attributes. That loss preceded a drop to Bantamweight by Cruz, which resulted in the rivalry quickly mutating from Cruz vs. Faber to Cruz vs. the entire Team Alpha Male. Now, Team Alpha Male is a bit of a self-aggrandizing name for a team. I mean, he may as well have called it Team Big Swinging Dicks. But in Uriah's case, it's not the most inappropriate name in the world. The guy is a born leader, a willing mentor, and a shrewd businessman. And he parlayed those attributes to create an environment which has cultivated much of the elite talent that has populated the upper ranks of the lighter weight classes for over a decade. Faber always impressed me in terms of his vision and investment savvy. There were certain individuals who through a series of creative and gutsy business ventures reveal an intelligence that is hard to reconcile with the way they present themselves in interviews. When Faber got into MMA, there was really no money in this sport especially at the lighter weight classes. So right out the gate, he started a clothing line and began channeling his earnings into real estate. In 2005, he bought his first house, which he later filled with Team Alpha Male members. Within a couple of years, there were four Faber-owned Alpha Male houses on the block, with many of the inhabitants also working in a gym. These were the circumstances under which Faber began to scout and develop the next generation of lighter weight talent. In 2008, he recruited Joseph Benavidez and Chad Mendez to the team, and would later recruit TJ Dillashaw and take Cody Garbrandt under his wing. Faber's list of business ventures includes Team Alpha Male, a clothing line, real estate including buying, and renovating and flipping houses, opening a fitness gym, writing a book, founding several websites, investing in a number of Sacramento sports teams, and appearing in several TV commercials. Many of these ventures began in his mid-twenties during a period in which he won the WEC featherweight title and defended it six times. So Faber might seem like a happy-go-lucky grown-ass kid, but he is one industrious motherfucker. Now the point of this tangent is not to kiss Faber's ass, but to emphasize something that you already know. 
that Uriah was more than just a coach or some dude with a gym. From an early age, Faber seemed to have figured out a philosophy for success, which he tried to instill in his teammates. Faber has stated he tried to provide an example for the fighters for how they could build lives that were more than just training and recovering from fights. And almost every Team Alpha male member has at some point referred to Uriah as not just a coach, but as a mentor. So Team Alpha Male and the careers of his teammates is almost as much a part of Uriah's MMA legacy as his own career. The team's greatest rival was an obsessively analytical perfectionist with an enigmatic and unpredictable style. A fist-fighting riddle that Team Alpha Male would fail to crack again for almost a decade. Dominic Cruz never seemed like the type of guy who was thinking about flipping houses, starting businesses, uh, launching a chain of whatever the fuck. Every interview I've ever seen of the guy, he seemed completely single-minded in his determination. And that was in pushing the limits of MMA and constantly evolving his style in a bid to reach the upper echelons of the pound-for-pound -pound list. The fruits of his labor were rapid and groundbreaking. Working in a two-man MMA think tank, Cruz and Eric Del Fierro developed a completely unique style. Centered on confusing footwork, non-stop motion, a never-ending sequence of headache-inducing feints, and a constant barrage of strikes from awkward angles. Over the next three years, Cruz went 8-0 captured the WEC Bantamweight title and defended it three times. Following Zuffa's purchase of the WEC and the addition of the featherweight and Bantamweight divisions, Cruz was awarded the UFC's Bantamweight belt. In that impressive win streak, he also picked up his first wins over Team Alpha Male by handing Joseph Benavidez a pair of losses while Faber watched on helplessly from the corner. During that same time period, the sport and his decision to punch above his weight had finally caught up with Uriah Faber, and he returned to the weight class in which he began his career. Following a pair of spectacular wins over Takeya Mizugaki and Eddie Wineland, Faber was announced as the first challenger for Cruz's newly awarded UFC belt. Despite its various forms, the rivalry was always most compelling between its originators. Heading into the rematch at UFC 132, Uriah tried to characterize Dominic as a bitter person. Even with him as champion, he's a jealous guy. He sees what I have, and that's what he wants. And I see what he has, and that's what I want. There's me having fun, and there's this guy with something to prove. Let's see who's boss. He's very motivated for this fight because he's all about jealousy and negative things like that. Responding to the above quote, Cruz later dismissed that characterization. Jealousy and bitterness will do nothing but hold you back. That's the last thing I feel. The thing that drives me is hearing his name after I get done winning and knowing that he gave me my only loss. That's what drives me, going and getting my loss back. That's what excites me. Proving that I shouldn't have lost the fight the first time. I'm better than him now and that I belong at the top as the Bantamweight champion. So Cruz may not have been jealous, but it was a huge fight for him. An opportunity to redeem his earlier mistake, erase the memory of that loss, and further validate the effectiveness of his unorthodox style. Fighting Uriah Faber and getting a chance to fight him again has been a driving factor in my career. No doubt. I never liked Uriah Faber. It's never left me. It's a chip that's there now. It's a chip that's gonna stay there. He ain't touching the belt. The UFC's inaugural Bantamweight title fight could not have been a more appropriate matchup. A grudge match years in the making. A dominant champion defending his belt against the longtime face of the lighter divisions and the only man to ever beat him. The bout was a competitive fight of the night battle. Faber had some big moments, even dropping Cruz. But ultimately over the five rounds, and despite anything Faber said, the result was uncontroversial. Cruz just outworked, outlanded, and basically outthought his old rival. For those keeping score, he was now 1-1 one one with Faber and up 3-1 in the overall rivalry with Team Alpha Male. Proving he had surpassed his oldest rival likely allowed him to enjoy the fruits of his labor more than ever.
because this was the period where a style he had felt was largely misunderstood and underappreciated began to be recognized as both a revolutionary and cerebral take on mixed martial arts. Cruz was now well and truly on top of the game, but he was about to start coming face to face with the fruits of Uriah's labor because that next generation of savages Faber had cultivated were now in the ascension. The upper echelon of Bantamweight was about to become a crowded clusterfuck of beefs, bad bloods, complicated splinters, and elite fucking talent. This incredible rivalry was really only getting started. <laughs> 